Hello, this is your host, Tom Lewis, the Prayers of Fellow podcast. Today, I'm again joined by Tim Patton, and we are here to discuss the implications of the American Revolution. Um, since the 4th of July was only four days ago, it seemed pertinent to, to discuss that issue. So um, why don't you open up uh, with some of what you your thoughts were and some of the content that you have before us here. Um, well, yes. Uh, since it was the 4th of July, I was uh, thinking about the three... 4th of July celebrates technically the American Revolution, which we've talked about two other major revolutions, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and then indirectly the French Revolution. Um, so, you know, the 4th of July celebrates, it's basically a secular holiday celebrating from the date the Declaration of Independence is signed, which is a fairly radical event um, in the British Empire's history. I mean, if you're familiar with British Empire history, uh, you know, probably Neil Ferguson to me is the person one of the best defend uh, explanations book empire um, the breakup of the, the first colony to go from the Brit, uh, British Empire in a quite interesting fashion it's a, it's an incredible upset victory the American Revolution is it actually in some ways goes right back into libertarian um, defense theories um, it really is as well but but um, but Fourth of July in some way might be a, a hollow holiday uh, because progressives and left liberals have much have they don't like a lot of the initial people and even some libertarians have a sort of hang up with um, the American Revolution because you get people like Brian Kaplan and this is actually the article one of the articles posted here asking why do we even need the American Revolution um, so a lot of conservatives and libertarians have a somewhat fuzzier relationship with the American Revolution and I was interested in hearing your opinions on the American revolutions. Is this an example of a priori politics? Um, is is the relationship between the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution? Um, and you know, is this the American Revolution like on the road to Jacobism? So that's what I'll open up here with. Yeah, um, I would argue that the American Revolution is is one of the few modern revolutions that that isn't a priori because. A few years back, I read all of the Federalist Papers, and what it struck me about the Federalist Papers was Madison, Jay, and, oh, I forget the guy's name. The guy that was Burr. No, not Burr, the other one, um, Hamilton. They all were using historical examples. They were talking about, they started with, like, the Greek Republics, and then the Roman Republic, and then the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Dutch, and the Swiss, and bits of English history, and they're looking at the pros and the cons of what worked and what didn't. And of course, that's also embedded in the broader anti-federalist papers, which I've only read some. And there was this robust debate, and everybody concerned was reading classical history and medieval history, and trying to figure out well, well what's what systems worked to preserve liberty in the past, what didn't, and the ones that did, why did they fail, and how can we best guard against that in the future? That is exactly the kind of attitude that one would expect from a more conservative outlook on society. I mean, we see like Aristotle's The Politics, we see something very similar where he goes through the different kinds of co governments and it looks at the historical and then his, his own contemporary landscape. And I would argue that at least in their method of forming a government, it was fairly, fairly, fairly conservative. What would be maybe less conservative, depending on your perspective, is the claims the revolution made. Um, and we can get into some of that. Uh, maybe you want to open up with the point counterpoint with uh, Hummel and Gab as far as the, the claims and causes of the revolution, because there's where it's not quite so clear whether it's conservative or not. All right. Well, there's, I think Todd posted them below, but there's the Jeffrey Hummel, who's a libertarian, large, he's, he sort of uh, floats in many libertarian circles, but uh, Jeffrey Hummel, uh, responding to Brian Kaplan's piece um, about about uh, do we need the American Revolution? Let me just pull it up here. So in this piece, he goes through an exploration of the positive externalities, um, and this, the first thing is first thing I think that Jeffrey Hummel's biggest point is to be made. Um, well, I'll, I'll stick to the the the. The main point to me, the main point to me, Jeffrey Hall makes is without the American Revolution, the British Empire would have acted more tyrannical. 
Um, this is one of the claims that uh, a lot of the monarchist supporters tend, to, even Edmund Burke somewhat tends to run from this. And, and even if you read a book like Hans Hoppe's Democracy, the God that failed, that one of the reasons why the monarchies behave is priced because of the threat of the Republican spirit. And in this piece, Jeffrey Hummer goes through all the examples of how the Republican spirit, which was one of the, now the question is this Republican spirit, Jacobin, was running through the American Revolution. And um, and if if they didn't, so one of the historians said if they didn't, if they didn't oppose the, the Townsend Act and the Coercive Act, they would have they would have went in with more acts um, and stronger controls, because um, one of the things that Edmund Burke is famous for is the trial of um, Hastings, um, and Hastings was handled uh, British rule in India very poorly, and uh, many of the American colonists did not want him to be treated for a variety of reasons, but even on even on strictly good reasons, um, I like. Um, like subjugated colonial people, so that Hummel makes the very good case of the positive externalities. I mean, it, it fought back against the mercantilism. Um, it 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 gave it cut away this this further ex, uh, extensions because you could argue that the taxes were justified, but there's always the threat of future taxes, and they repealed five of them, but they didn't repeal them all, um, and they weren't pointing assemblies. That were paid for by uh, local taxes. Foreign rulers were being appointed to pay for by local taxes. And even Edmund Burke argues himself, why would why would English people accept this? They're English. Um, they're Protestant English. They don't accept being ruled by tyrants. What are you, a Germanic king? I think he says that in the his masterpiece, which Hazlitt says is a masterpiece um, about um, Edmund Burke's speech to Parliament on American taxation. Um, the other person I would bring up here is Sean Gabb, and he makes, he's PFS, the Property Freedom Society, he makes the case against the American War of Independence. And his main argument is that if you were the establishment British ruling class, and this is made in the second half, um, it's a divine right monarchy, but even if you get away from that, um, if you have assembly where the monarch's acting through, if you get more assemblies, so if you get, and considering the fact that America's growth would grow, would grow across the continent, um, also the British had holdings in, at the point in New Zealand and Australia, and East Indies, well, they later have Australia, but um, you get more of these assemblies, the king could uh, play off all of these assemblies and go shopping, and that would undermine the position of the local people living in the home islands. And that, that, that Sean Gadd made that argument really well and I think that's an argument that Americans aren't very aware of. Um, and that, that's that's basically where I'll end here. I'll pass it back to Todd. Yeah, I would argue as far as Gab's point, it's really kind of moot after the revolution. Now, it might make sense saying that making those claims while still members of the British system would lead to that problem. And, and maybe even, you know, would be a valid criticism of the demands. But once they left... Um, I don't necessarily see how that's an argument against the revolution itself because the king won't go shopping with to a foreign nation at this point. Um, but I, I also, I didn't really realize that many of the founders were cognizant of the uh, behavior of the East India Company. And they saw the creeping mercantilism in the New World as a possible attempt for the people at the East India Company to take over. I mean, the East India Company was pretty terrible. I mean... There's very good reasons to uh, to not want to have that replicated over here. Yes. They do make a very interesting point counterpoint. Yes. Um, so, so the American Revolution is almost if you start if you start from the point where it could have gone much worse, and I think that's a very legitimate fear. Um, um, I think I think Burke makes that point that it was a very legitimate fear that. <laughs> You know, they're not just going to stop at the towns that they'll just keep going they'll keep going and they'll rule like uh oriental despots do you think that's a legitimate fear that the british empire would have behaved like oriental despots I, you know I, I think it is because certainly with the behavior in the east in the east india company uh in in the orient certainly could give some people pause to think that might be the case now would they behave that way over white british settlers as opposed to non-white European natives, 
that's not quite clear. Um, I can see why you'd be afraid of it, but I mean, I don't really see Britain in part because of course the king himself was killed in the civil war by, by Englishmen because they did not want to put up with this. Um, and, you know, I wonder, you know, would they have really tried to restore the power of the king? I think the fear of the power of the king is, is a little moot because after the glorious revolution, especially the power of the king was effectively broken. I think, a more, I think a more serious fear was that of the East India Company and the rising mercantilism. That one, I think, is a more legitimate fear than that of a king. Um, and if there was going to be any despotic rule in the New World, it would have been at the hands of these monopolistic corporations and not so much some sort of, like, czarist or Qing dynasty emperor or something. All right, well, now let's move to the American revolutionists themselves. Um, one of the claims you can make is that the reason why that they wanted revolution is they wanted the power themselves. Jefferson, Washington. I mean, it, it's it's clear that Washington should benefit. Um, there's some argument to made that he literally started the Seven Years' War up in, you know, he led a raiding party. I mean, he owned a lot of property along the Potomac, which would increase in value. Um, same way with Jefferson. All these guys stood to gain significantly. And at the time, um, the geopolitical situation was France controlled West of somewhere west of the Appalachians, but the borders were very fuzzy. Um, and at the time, at the Seven Years' War, there was relative peace. Um, so none of them stood to gain from the current situation in, in growth and trade. Um, and also, if they wanted to make their own empire, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, um, these were basically American nationalists. Um, they, I mean, they had no, they had no empire. They, they, they were no different than other nationalists, but they were American nationalists and they wanted to make their own empire. So what would you make about that claim? Like they wanted to protect their own, <laughs> they wanted to be their own tyrants. What would you say to that argument? Well, I, I do think that there is a lot of, of evidence that the, the interests of, of the mercantile class, but we also tend to forget the frontier class because frontiersmen were upset. The, the Indian law was at 1763 where England said you couldn't go any further west. Uh, then some point beyond the Appalachians, and and they wanted to further go, it, it, you know, all the way to the other side of the continent. Ultimately, um, and then those people also stood to lose uh, from the British system at, at this point. Um, and, and and yeah, I mean, a lot of these people were smugglers, right? Wasn't uh, Sam Adams? Not Sam Adams. John Hancock was a smuggler. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think with all political revolutions, there's some self-interested motivation for it. Um, I know even, even like, say, the, the overthrowing of the Tarquin by the Roman Republic with Brutus. Uh, Brutus is sort of seen as a universal hero by Republicans and revolutionaries. But, but again, he, uh, he probably had his own self-interested motivations for that as well. Well, I don't know how helpful that is. I mean, to some extent all people in political power are somewhat cynical. I mean, that's not an argument. Oh, yeah. That's not necessarily an argument against any and all political systems because even with cynical operators, some systems are better than others. But yeah, I think the money class and the frontier class certainly had interests in leaving the constraints the British system put upon them. Yeah, but, and the same, but by the same token, the Tories had self-interested reasons for maintaining the British rule because, as Hubble points out, they had a lot of land tied up in these obscure feudal laws. Uh, the Anglican Church stood to gain money from tithes and such. So there were self-interested motivations for the Tories to stay within the British system. Yeah, and also the and the Neil Ferguson makes this point: the death of the fact that they eliminated France as a you know foreseeable threat gave the Americans themselves a boost of independence. They had nobody. I mean, the Spanish weren't going to threaten them up from Florida. Um, th the only real threat was the French from the north. The French from the west were not going to... They were really the only French colony at that point was New Orleans, and that wasn't really much of a threat. So the only threat was Indians at that point. Well, at that time, at that time, it was a Spanish colony. New Orleans? Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. It only, it only went to Napoleon during a sale yep. uh, in the early 19th century. Um, but I think one of the things that your first question sort of hinted at was was this the road to Jacobinism? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and 
at times I've, I've, I've stated, I think it did. Um, but the American revolution is, I think is more complicated than say the Russian or the French revolutions in the sense that there are elements that are extremely conservative about it. So for example, in uh, one of the things you gave, the Yuval Levin, uh, the great debate, uh, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine on the birth of right and left, and the Econ Talk lecture, he pointed out that Edmund Burke was a gradual reformist that believed in maintaining, uh, you know, don't, don't don't burn society to the ground, you know, kind of a Cambodian year zero and start over. No, what, what you want to do is you you want to preserve the elements of that we that we've already inherited that work well and refine them um and and so there's an interesting comment by the venezuelan liberal play, uh, uh, po political activist and author carlos Rangel in his book the latin americas their love-hate relationship with the united states and on page 23 and 24 he says this um he says but the North American millenarian kingdom was from the start sensible, rational, pragmatic, moderate in all but its ambition. One might say the new republic was born conservative. From the birth of the new nation, its government was to be dominated by one idea that stood in opposition to the radicalism of Samuel Adams and later to the Jacobin influences of the French Revolution. The idea that the new republic should maintain, develop, and improve the society that preceded the revolution, not destroy it. And I think that's key. It did not seek to destroy pre-existing uh, structures in toto. I mean, of course, some would have to be destroyed, as Homo points out. Some of the more old world elements that, that the British Tories wanted to protect. But other elements like English liberties and, and, and you know, decentralized uh, voluntary societies and all those things, they were preserved. They, you know, they didn't try to radically change gender relations like in the french revolution you know or or other other things you know they still respected the rights of property they still respected things like that i, I think i think also in rothbard's uh, article he gave me he, he's a fundamental weakness in the analysis he thinks that any radical change is leftist because he says oh it's a revolution things changed it must be well no i mean would the ayatollah khomeini be considered a leftist would cromwell be considered a leftist they both created theocracies which are typically seen as the extreme of right-wing reaction. Um, so yes, a revolution entails radical change, but it doesn't necessarily entail that it's of the left. Um, and I think in that respect, the, the, the fact that they built a government based on analyzing what had worked and what didn't work in the past is very conservative, very Burkean, you know, protecting institutions that have already existed. But in the other sense, it was, it, if it was radical, it was radically libertarian rather than radically Jacobin. Um, and I think that's in part why so many libertarians resonate with the American Revolution, unlike the French. Right? For the French Revolution, it was the goal of the state to remake society and man in the way it should be. Whereas the American Revolution did have some very radical notions about equality and individuals, but the idea was that the state should get out of their way and let them flourish on their own court. So I think the radicalism was libertarian rather than Jacobin. All right, well... My first question then is, um, do you think Burke is being somewhat weaselly by supporting one revolution and then disavowing the next revolution? We'll, we'll stick to very purely intellectual motives. So some people accuse Burke of being on the payroll of such and such, but that's parliamentary politics. But do um, you think he's being revolution? Because that's the, some of the claims that some of the more Austrian libertarians are. Hans Hoppe type libertarians will make now that the American Revolution was actually a centralizing feature, especially the Constitution. You know that, that they needed a central government and for to create a mercantilist empire of their own. So, so that's a sort of different direction. That's a sorry for the side side step there, but I'll stick to the first question. Do you think Burke is being Weasley? Because you, know, you start you start with one reform and then you go. It's these keep going down the road to reform. So that's my question. I I don't think uh, okay. In principle, one can support one revolution and not another because I think any revolution 
is contextual based on a variety of factors. And what makes the factors that made one revolution just may not be present in the next one. Um, now, then the question is, was that the case of the American Revolution or the French Revolution? Well, from Burke's point of view, the American Revolution, I think, was fairly Burkean. It sought to preserve already existing institutions. Uh, granted, the reform wasn't gradual. Uh, you know, it was rather rapid in the case of the revolutionary period. But unlike the French Revolution, it didn't seek to you know, reset society. And again, the, the rallying cry of the revolutionaries was the rights of Englishmen. So I, I could see how many uh, Whigs who also believe in this idea of progress throughout history would be drawn to the American Revolution. They would see it as a natural extension of their own political ideology. Whereas the French Revolution, I mean, I, I know it's a bit crude, but I, I think the idea of a positive and negative liberty I think is an important consideration. The, the American Revolution was more interested in negative liberty. There were some positive rights, of course, you know, a right to a lawyer, uh, right to not be a victim of double indemnity. Those are certainly uh, positive rights, but it was primarily more of a negative rights system, whereas the French Revolution was a positive rights system. Um, and, and I think the, the thing from Bastiat you sent me hints at that, right? The French Revolution is about redistributing other people's wealth back to yourself, whereas the Americans just wanted to be, you know, left alone, free to pursue their own individual desires. And I, I think I think Burke could be within his rights to support the American and not the French Revolution. Um, well, I'll go back to my first point. So what do you think about the libertarian turn? And this has been made by others that, that the American Revolution was a sort of pernicious example. If they would have kept the English, the English monarchy would have gave them their own assemblies, um, they'd be better off. Um, that, that, that slavery would have been, uh, would not have had the U.S. Civil War. We would have, the British Empire could have had the ability to stay in, in contact. You know, Neil Ferguson makes great defense of the British Empire. Lots of, lots of modern day liberals, whether they admit it or not, like a lot of the elements of what the British Empire did. Um, even progressive liberals like them. Um, um, same uh, same thing like that. So, and then the Hans Hoppe, Stefan Gensela types will now say that's the centralization that Washington and Jefferson just wanted to get the Constitution so they could get themselves political power and p build their own empire. Even Thaddeus Russell will make that claim that that, uh, that the empire was just an empire building exercise. Uh, that these guys were all em imperialists and they just wanted to expand west. Um, and you get and you get progressives now saying that you know. This this is one of the reasons that I was interest I got kick out of Fourth of July because some progressives will call um, you know half the American founders like white supremacists get their their setting off Fourth of July fireworks. That's sort of what, what made me think of this. Um, so what would you make about that claim that these people were just? I mean, I, I progressively ramped up the criticisms there, but what would you make of those kind of criticisms? Okay, so the first criticism was that all of these rights and liberties we take for granted would have evolved naturally even if we hadn't left the British Empire? Yes. Well, again, that's a counterfactual, and we can't really know for sure what would have happened, but I think Hummel does give an interesting uh, a counter to that. Um, and, and that's often the case, right, that there's certain cases where well, we take for granted that, that one a course one nation took. It took as a result of losing some conflict or endeavor, and that only in defeat did they reevaluate their position or or give way for a new group to take over. Um, so, like even Solzhenitsyn writes in the Global Archipelago, right? People gain gain their liberty by losing, losing a war, so they stop being an empire. He mentions a Sweden losing in the Great Northern War. Now, he at this point he was still not a Christian, so he mentioned the. Uh, February Revolution, which was more of a liberal revolution rather than the Bolshevik one, and, and others. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting, you know, what, what, what sort of like tyrannical monopolistic corporation have been uh, the one in charge? And it, it's likely that maybe that could have happened. You know, slaveholders in the South and the West Indies joining together to, to fight uh, against them. Um, abolitionists again that's another possibility so i think it's it's a bit too glib really because we don't really know either way it's certainly interesting to speculate 
Um, and certain educated guesses might be made, but again, we, we don't really know. And, and the fact that they were merely empire builders. Well, I mean, to some extent, they were empire builders. I mean, in the Federalist Papers, they do speak of an empire of liberty numerous times. But to say merely that, or that was their only motivation, seems rather mean-spirited and narrow. I mean, uh, lots of people can have multiple, even contradictory motivations for doing something. Um, and so, for example, you know, the idea of, you know, building a society based on liberty, at least for, uh, you know, the, the in-group, the, the white Anglos, you know, okay. I mean, to say that they're not, you know, are, are you are they saying that they didn't really have a desire for liberty? Um, I, that that would seem to go against everything they wrote. Um, they just certain they just seem they seem to think that. See, part of this is imposing our values on the 18th century, right? Most people in the 18th century would not have viewed even like radical Jacobins even. I mean, I mean, after all, the Haitian Revolution took place against Napoleon, who was a radical Jacobin um, in his ideology. They just didn't view people either as, as what, what, what we would say people, um, or if they were people, they were, they were for whatever uh, social or racial reason not capable of bearing freedom. Uh, and so, you know, as far as I understood what free men were, yeah, I think they were, I think they were deeply concerned about that. Yeah, that was Burke's. That was Burke's point in the speech to Parliament. Why would you expect them to accept the Townsend Act or the Course of Acts? They're Englishmen. They're Protestant Englishmen. This is going to go terribly wrong. They're going to resist this till their deaths, and they did. I mean, most you know the Declaration of Independence. I mean, I have a lot of respect for the Declaration of Independence because all of them were signing. I mean, they were signing a high treasonous act. I mean, they, I mean, if you read Nassim Nicholas Taleb's Skin in the Game, this is this is the very skin in the game proposition. This is not, you know, you, know, you can't just write one of these documents, um, um, send it, and not get, you know, burned for it. Would you agree to that statement? Oh yeah, I mean that that's a huge risk. I mean, you know, uh, at that point, as Ben Franklin also, said, assuredly we'll all hang together, or we should all hang together, or surely we'll all hang separately. Also, um. Also, considering their wealth, this is actually could use their wealth in some ways against, in, in some ways in favor of them. Considering their wealth, uh, considering their position, why would these people, I mean, why wouldn't these people do this on principled grounds? Um, you know, uh, I, I mean, Jefferson and Washington were some of the richest men in, in the world. Actually, uh, there was an econ talk that goes over this, which is a more of a takedown of them, but that they were some of the richest men in the world. So, so. Why wouldn't they uh, go after <laughs> this on high principled grounds? There's, they're, they're very comfortable, but keep on going. Well, for example, right, I imagine these same kinds of people would say that Oliver Cromwell was just motivated by a, a, a religious fanaticism to control people. Like he, like he didn't really care about the abuses of King Charles or that, you know, because he was a landowner, you know, he, he didn't really care about the rights and liberties of Englishmen. I mean, again, there's no evidence in his own life or written record that he didn't actually mean what he said about the rights of Englishmen. Certainly his, you know, his working together with the levelers, even if he didn't go to the extremes the levelers would have wanted, he certainly gave them an in that any other political leader at the time would not likely have even given him a seat at the table. Um, and so again, it's, it's not to say that it's wholly misdirected because there are certain elements of truth to it, but it's exaggerated, I think, and and just not taking them at face value. I mean, how do you know what they really were thinking? I mean, are we really trying to psychoanalyze people 250 years ago? I think some progressives try to do it. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems like some libertarians do too, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I'll go to the next... I, I made it again, but I'll remind you of it. Um, what do you think about the certain libertarians criticizing the American Revolution? You get that from, in some ways, from Rothbard, in some ways from the Hoppians vis-a-vis -vis the democracy, the God, the fail. You get that some ways uh, from... Actually, I don't think you get that from Mises at all. Again, I'm not, Mises, I'm less well-read on Mises. Um, Mises was in favor of the British Empire and a one-world government. Okay. So Mises would be against the American Revolution. Um, I'm not saying he'd be against the American Revolution, but I mean he's in favor of the, the 19th century British Empire because it created that, uh, what, what 
Deepak Lal called the LEO, the Liberal International Economic Order. All right, so 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 I'll move on to the the third thing. So so what do you do? You find it odd that that um, the Fourth of July still gets celebrated in like this 2018 climate of this anti-fascist climate um, because. Because you could make the argument, and you get this from even, as I just pointed out, from some libertarians, you know, that these guys are, um, um, you know, half of them were slave owners, a third of them were nationalists, you know, a third of them. What would you say about that claim? Um, because you get, I mean, I was recently at a library, um, and they had a book about, you know, the origins of, 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 you know, I think that's Coates' point or something like that. Uh, the origins of something or other in, in American Revolution. What do you make about that point? Yeah, I, I think that's rubbish. That's like saying Athens wasn't really a democracy because it didn't give the franchise to women or slaves. I mean, Athens invented the idea of a democracy. I mean, you can't say the inventor of an idea wasn't a practitioner of it. Uh, and, and in many ways, the American experiment invented these terms that we are throwing around so glibly. Well, they invented those terms, just like Athens. To say they weren't truly that system when they're the ones that invented it seems rather. I mean, uh, we we we've taken them to certain conclusions that may or may not be the logical ones from those founding principles, uh, and we see that there's a disconnect. But that's based on our assumptions derived from uh, history, experience, and, and the principles themselves. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're being. I think though the one area of inconsistency that that might seem to lend some credence to this is that they held slaves. But but again, historically throughout the Western tradition, going back to ancient Greece, slavery and liberty were not seen as incompatible. Uh, that's really an Enlightenment notion. Uh, whether it was you know the 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 ancient Hebrews and the Judges or the Greeks, Romans. Or the Italian city states, or the Dutch, you could be, you could, you could maintain liberty for some and not for others. You see, we seem to think today, if you don't assume liberty for all, then you must be a hypocrite. But since they never advocated liberty for all, they're not being hypocrites for not giving liberty to all. Yeah, and actually, many of them themselves ended up uh, either freeing them, much, which is, which is, <laughs> like, which. Tell a progressive to get rid of his government job. That would be that would be the only corollary I could think of. Um, well, and also, well, let's be honest. You know, a lot of these radical progressives work at state universities. Yeah, I know, I know. That's like only in the United States could an anarchist uh, like Noam Chomsky maintain his anarchist bona fides working for you know a MIT. government university. Yeah, MIT. I know. Oh, like only... the... And he's a pacifist too. At MIT is like one of the biggest. Like weapons designer, I think I could be speaking off the cuff here, but uh, weapons designer. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So, and and not only that, you know, Noam Chomsky claims to be against intellectual property in theory, but in practice, all of his work is copyrighted. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, notice, notice, they won't level that complaint against Chomsky or yeah. other radical thinkers. Yeah. So, I, I mean, in the same Talib's word, they have definitely fu money. All all of these guys, uh, who, and actually, it's the it's. It's the poor ones like Hamilton who are born penniless are the ones that in the end had the shadiest policies that took us in some ways. Um, now, Michael Malice might make good defense of Alexander Hamilton, but um, it's the, the, it, the really wealthy ones like Jefferson, Washington, Adams. These guys were all um, signed death, basically signed their own death warrants. And many of them ended up freeing their slaves or doing, treating them very well. So, so unlike unlike some progressives today um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, all right so let's let's move on to let's move on away from Edmund Burke and to his the other half of Yorville Levin's Thomas Paine so Thomas Paine's more of an interesting character um he he's a, one thing that he's famous for to me at least he's, he's a very good deist um he wrote a whole book about in defense of deism um, um, but uh, would you classify him as a Jacobin? Um, is he, you know, uh, Yervil Levin uses him as a counterpoint to uh, Edmund Burke? Um, well, what strikes me about Payne 
is he seems to remind me of people, okay, for example, in the 20th century, even many anarchists were caught up in the Russian, even Bolshevik revolution. Uh, even Emma Goldman was very favorable, even to Lenin in the beginning, but then when she and her husband went to, 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 to Russia, she saw the, 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 the suppressing of the Kronstadt riots. She's like, this, this, is, uh, this is worse than uh, the strikes that are going on in Pennsylvania uh, two decades earlier. And, you know, basically what, what, what we see here is I think in a lot of ways, pain is like, a, is like Goldman. He's, he's enamored by the French Revolution and is willing to go along with it. But then he starts to see things that don't add up. Like, for example, uh, the killing of the king he thought was excessive. You know, I think it was the article by Hitchens that you sent me. He mentions that he was against the expropriation of royal and church property and the murder of the king because it's just not the, the, the legal thing to do. And, and the Jacobins are like, screw you, and they threw him in prison. So he... I don't know what to make of Payne. Payne does seem to have some Jacobin elements, you know, his militant anti-theism uh, in this Age of Reason book. Though earlier on in his life, when he wrote Common Sense, he used a lot of biblical analogies. I think he's he's a somewhat contradictory figure. Um, I think maybe Payne would really fit nicely, almost like in the New Deal pantheon, like with like FDR and Truman, almost, especially oh, yeah. with like welfare state arguments. Thomas Paine, I mean, I think it's in the crisis is one of the best motivational speeches ever written. I mean, uh, like, heaven knows how to value things, but we take too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. It's only in its dearness uh, we give it value. I mean, I mean, that guy's a great at rhetoric, great at oratory. Um, I mean, that's that's a lovely piece of uh, writing. Would you agree? Oh yeah, many many of these thinkers and writers of the 18th and early 19th centuries. Are, are extremely intelligent and articulate men. Okay, so we got through Thomas Paine. Well, next, we'll go to um, Thomas Jefferson. Um, Jacobin or not? Uh, well, you he, see, th this, this is what makes Jefferson strange, right? In certain ways, both anarchists uh, and, and Southern nationalists can appeal to Jefferson's agrarian anti-statism. You know, he warned about the mercantilism of the New England states that was rallying around the Federalist Party. Uh, you know, he, he was behind the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions. Uh, and both, both you, know, you, got, you got people on the far left, like Noam Chomsky, which they always, he was a flawed man, but, you know, prefigured anarchism. You've got people like Christopher Hitchens, who's a neocon. Then you've got, you know, Southern nationalists and libertarians who all for various reasons support him in, in that regard. And so it's a certainly decentralizing aspect to him. But then he also had a you know anti-theist streak, um, and which again is more akin to Jacobinism, at least superficially. Though I, I think I think Jefferson probably isn't a Jacobin because his his idea of the natural aristocracy, he basically seemed to have he's an idea. Yeah, because remember, he, for an aristocracy is anti-egalitarian, right? So a Jacobin one is, is an egalitarian, right? It's in it's in their liberty, equality, fraternity. You know, Jefferson wasn't an egalitarian, but even though he did have support for the French Republic during his presidency, that seems to be more tactical. Like he just wanted to bring down another monarchy to have it replaced with an ally, um, like many others. And even even Hitchens mentions his terrible Adam and Eve letter. Yeah, uh, that that thing is that thing is that thing is awesome. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that that's that that is that right there is straight up Jacobinism. <laughs> um, you know, I don't. I mean, uh, um, I, although although Edmund Burke, you could accuse him of being uh, Rothbard accuses him of being a uh, when he wrote his um, what was what was the piece that Edmund Burke, that Rothbard thought that Edmund Burke was written in his parody, but Rothbard thought it was. Um, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember. All right, that's that's relevant. I don't want to think live on the air here like that. Um, all right, so so I just saw one of the comments. What do you think about the claim that they that they were the least taxed colonies of the world at the time? Um, this is a common claim that gets made. You know, why uh, why why have a revolution over uh, a, a three percent of whatever whatever the precise math would be five percent increase in taxes? This is a waste of time, especially considering their wealth. Um, is this a is this a is this a effective argument to be made? Um, well, again, I don't know compared to what other colonies they were taxed. I know they were taxed lightly, 
Well, one of the interesting things though about about free people uh, is in a book that's somewhat dodgy and is is five thousand year history of debt. Uh, David Graeber, the anarchist, points out that throughout most of history, the the the, the quote privileged people, the people with liberty, usually didn't pay taxes at all. Not just in the United, Col the United States colonies, but even the Roman Republic, the Greek city states. Those were for you know non citizens and slaves. So it seems that if, if you really do value your liberty, then then that sort of affront could be seen as an affront to your liberty and an ultimate presage of your own servitude. If that is, if if we can take what he's saying at face value, that that was what most uh, free societies in the ancient medieval world uh, thought of it. So, and, and that's also another thing. This is what Hummel gets at too, right? Is yeah, is is it that much to begin with? Well, no, but. It could go much further. It could go much further, exactly. Um, and it's it's almost like the principle of the thing. So again, that that depends on a variety of uh, indications and such. So it it might be effective, but I, I think more it, just as a slogan, it's not very effective. There needs to be more effort put into it. I'm not saying more effort couldn't de demonstrate its validity, but just as a slogan, it, it seems weak. Um. Okay. Um, James Madison, probably the principal author of the Constitution, um, uh, um, um, within it from the start. What would you say? I don't think you could argue he's a Jacobin. Um, he's very well read. In no, no, Ma Madison. Madison is one of the the centrists. I think. Um, do you uh, think group. of the three aforementioned three people I just mentioned? Do you think any of them would fit as like? We'll classify them as Rothbardian libertarians, Hoppian libertarians, Randian objectivists. Like if I of those three, or or just like um, or like Nick Gillespie libertarians of the three mentioned, Payne, Jefferson. Oh, the three Madison. Payne, Jefferson, and Madison. Yeah. Uh, well, Payne, Payne would be a left libertarian from like C4SS. Um, Agreed. and let's see, Je Jefferson. I, I could see Jefferson being a Rothbardian. And then I could see Madison being more of a Beltway libertarian. <laughs> I could see that too. All right, next up, uh, Washington. Uh, Washington is probably the least intellectual of them. Uh, of them, uh, but I'll throw him in. He wrote the least by far. Um, what would you make of him? Washington, as far as a political thinker, he's he's more important as a sort of moral compass or moral lodestone for the revolution by his sacrifice and his example than, than for what he wrote or, or, or philosophized about. I, I think that's more of how Washington is perceived. Um, is, there, is there any major key players I'm missing? Franklin. Oh, Franklin. Oh, man. He, he would be like... Uh, He'd be like, you know, one of those uh, East or West Coast hipster libertarians, like, you know, going to like, you know, the, the, the Whole Foods and, and the Starbucks and all that. That'd be Franklin. So you, you, would, you wouldn't classify him as a Jacobin? No, no, no. I don't think Jack, he was a Jacobin. Uh, I, I think Franklin. No, you know what Franklin would be? He would be the kind of libertarian like Thaddeus Russell is. That's a, that's a fairly good comparison there. You know, um, he was the kind of guy that just wanted to live the good life, the Dolce Vita lifestyle, and you know, the king was just kind of getting in the way of that. All right, so, so if that's, is there anybody I'm missing that you can think of? I mean, we we Hamilton wasn't on the list. Yeah. Um, Hamilton was a bit. I, I don't know. He's certainly not a Hoppian libertarian. I mean, you know, Hop Hoppians and other libertarians loathe Hamilton. Uh, he's he's just more of a nationalist, I guess. But I don't know if there really were any happy and libertarians in the American Revolution, because certainly none of them thought monarchies were private governments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you make of if you read Hans, take the Hans Hoppe Democracy, the God, the Failed, and then apply the analysis to the American Revolution? Um, what do you make of this? What do you, would you make of that? Do you think that's a a coherent take so so as I as we said in the last podcast in some ways the Soviet the, the czarist 
government sort of disproves uh, some technical sense Hans Hoppe's claim. I'm not against Hans Hoppe, first of all. You know, if you heard the first episode, I like Hans Hoppe a lot. But what would you make of that claim about Hans Hoppe's analysis of monarchies on an actual monarchy's rule here? Uh, in their oh, you colonies? mean you mean that sense since in a democratic government, uh, nobody quote owns the state. They they don't take care of it. They let it all go to seed. Yes. I mean, that's just demonstrably false. I mean, the United States is one of the best governed nations in history. I mean, if we were incompetently governed, we wouldn't be in charge of the world right now. I mean, you know, we, we would have lost to the Mexicans or the Spanish or somebody, but we didn't. Uh, and even England, right? Um, he, he considers constitutional monarchies as... Uh, democratic governments. But, you know, in War and Peace, Tolstoy says the Englishman can take respect in the fact that he lives in the best governed nation in the world. I mean, so, um, you know, I just think that's demonstrably false. Uh, the United States and England are, and the Dutch, under their under their Republican system, you know, the, the 13 uh, United Provinces, were the best governed states in, in the world. And that was why they were so successful punching above their weight, you know, the United Provinces was only a population of 2 million. You know, England at the time of Napoleon had a population of 10 million. And the 13 colonies had an original population of only 3 million. And yet, you know, they were punching far above their weight uh, as, as nations uh, than you would have indicated. And also, in, and also in many cases with inferior land, inferior um, resources. Oh, exactly. Latin America was far better endowed with land resources than North America was. Uh, but they, they didn't they didn't develop it. And if you look at old Europe, what were some of the most incompetent and mismanaged states? Monarchies. The French monarchy, which led to the French Revolution, the uh, Spanish monarchy, which led to which ultimately collapsed into the Second Republic, which then led to the Spanish Civil War. I mean, the Habsburgs were, you know, extremely inefficient and corrupt after, say, 1550 um, or 1580. Um, and then the Bourbons, you know, they're, they're a byword for incompetence. You know, there was a saying that the Bourbons uh, was, uh, learned nothing and forgot nothing. So, you know, they, they just didn't get the picture. Um, and you can also look at how China was managed. I mean, one, one might say that the uh, certainly Mao was, was a terrible disaster for China, but if you look at the, the current oligarchy from Deng Xiaoping onward, you know, compared to the squalor and the dunghill that China was economically and uh, otherwise, um, you know, the ping click has done pretty well for China, relatively speaking. Uh, they, they finally got to the middle class now. They're finally, you know, en engaging in the international markets, which they were not doing, you know, in the imperial period. And they certainly didn't have many freedoms in the imperial period. So I, I just, the, the, the problem with democracy, the God that failed, is the problem with a priori philosophy. It completely ignores what we actually see around us. Okay, because I think, I think um, at least amongst reactionaries, uh, reactionary libertarians, democracy, I, I wouldn't classify myself as a reactionary libertarian, by the way, but... Um, uh, Hans Hoppe's book, Democracy, the God, the Failed, is one of the better, um, was one of the key central pieces. And I think a lot of these, a lot of them will straight up admit that. Would you agree to that claim? That it's one of the more influential books amongst... Oh, it's, it's the, hugely influential amongst reactionaries. Um, it's just, I think, mostly completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas are right in it, I agree. But the whole claim, I, I disagree. I think, I think... Con so if, if you have a ranking of governments, would you put constitutional monarchies on top or would you put like uh, republics or republics with natural, some version of inherited traditions and rights? Would you put that on top or would you put constitutional monarchies on top? I, I would tend to go with republics. Um, now, again, there needs to be a kind of like, like two distinctions, right? There's the sort of classical republics, which we envision the Greek city-states, the Roman Republic. The Italian city-states of the Middle Ages, the, the Swiss, the Dutch. And I think to some extent the United States was the final iteration of that process. I mean, granted, it had, it had Enlightenment themes to it. 
but it was it was self-consciously i think the natural evolution of that process of looking at the his because each republic would look at the past republics and and try to you know at least ideally would try to then produce better institutions than the ones that came before whereas you've got like the jacobin republics like say the soviet union the jacobins the uh, states in latin america in the 1830s that are trying to you know re, re recreate man that those are disasters waiting to happen but i would probably put a republic on top Constitutional monarchies aren't too bad. And they'd probably be second place, like England and Scandinavia. But um, Next question. Um, do you think the American Revolution in its form owes a lot to the Constitution, uh, which is some would call a coup, almost a coup, because the Articles of Confederation were the thing that were tied together, the, f the, first, you know, the first edit, and then, you know, few years later, they remit. you know, a lot of anarchists say no one agreed to the Constitution. Um, it, you know, it was another coup d'etat. What would you say to that claim? Oh, that it was a coup d'etat. Um, well, it is interesting. According to the Articles of Confederation, it could not be dissolved without a universal consent of all the states. And I think one state, I forget if it was Vermont or Delaware, decided not to consent. And they still changed it anyhow. Um, I mean, could it toss a bit of a strong word? I mean, it's not like Washington came at the head of the Continental Army and said, "Okay, guys, I'm in charge now." I think, I think what Oliver Cromwell did could be more appropriately called a coup d'état. You know, where he overthrew the the, the Parliament to install his dictatorship. Um, normally, coup d'états are associated with a military takeover. Um, I don't know. I, maybe it seems a bit uh, rhetorically more of a rhetorical flourish than anything else. Um, do you think there was any chance that a, a Napoleon could have emerged um, in the United States? Uh, maybe that's a sort of hilarious claim to make. But that was Burke's prediction about the French Revolution. Do you think there was a chance that a Napoleon hmm. could have emerged in the United States? Do you think well, we were lucky that it didn't emerge? Do you think it was... Um, you know, I think I think that a Napoleon emerging in the United States would have been very, very difficult. The reason why I think it would have been very, very difficult is one of the reasons why the Jacobin Revolution was so destructive and so terrible was because it took over a heavily centralized state. You know, the ancient regime under Louis XIV, you know, he said, I am the state. Uh, it was an extremely centralized autocratic system. And, and it basically, imagine it's like a shoe or a boot, and the Jacobins put their foot in the boot. And now they had all the power, and they could radically change society. And furthermore, France, being a continental power, had a long tradition of, of standing armies uh, and of uh, you know honoring generals for their military triumphs. Uh, in the 13 colonies, we didn't have standing armies. We didn't have professional soldiers. And, and, you know, we, we didn't really have these, like, you know, warrior heroes, say, between Plymouth and 1775. Let's say the French had, you know, the French could appoint to point the heroes, you know, like Clovis and Charlemagne and, uh, you know, Joan of Arc, these, these military heroes that led, uh, led armies. We didn't have a standing army. We didn't have a centralized state. Uh, I think that right there makes it almost impossible for Napoleon to arise. Uh because the, the 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 conditions that had to be there weren't there. Even if the even if Napoleon Bonaparte had been born in North Carolina, and had tried to do what he did, he wouldn't have had the power to do so. There was no standing army. I mean, who would have given him all the troops to do this? Um, and even if say George Washington had tried to march on the Capitol, um, you could just see a, I think something not unlike the civil war between the Irish in the early 1920s would take place. You know, after uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, there were two groups of Irish and during the civil war, one that wanted to continue to fight England to get all of the uh, island and another group that said, well, okay, we got enough. We'll, we'll work with this and, you know, worry about Northern Ireland later. They just fell into infighting because there was no standing army. You know, Washington had a, had a hell of a time keeping the troops in the field. 
I mean, it's quite likely if you would turned all Napoleon on people, they would have just gone home. Exactly. All right. So, so based on the decentralized nature of the 13 colonies, that's almost impossible, I think. Um, moving on. Uh, what would you make of the... Uh, do you think there's been a uh, successful reincarnation of the American Revolution in some place other than the 13 colonies? Uh, do you think there's been another example of something like this happening? Where... Well, do, do, yeah, Rhodesia. didn't last very long because the international community destroyed it. But, yeah, for the brief time it was an independent nation, it, it rebelled against England, and it did pretty much a really good job of organizing society. But the international community destroyed it, and it's now a footnote to history. I I, I would agree. Um, anywhere in the East, in in Asia, would you say? Well, as far as I mean, not as a revolutionary project, but I think Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong have all internalized the 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 the, the best of the Anglo Anglo values quite well. Oh yeah, I I would agree there. Um, Oh, but they wouldn't be, They none of them would, well, actually, Taiwan in some ways is a revolution, um, an actual, they fled mainland China to Taiwan. Um, Japan was a military occupation. South Korea, that's... Uh, well, well, hold on, let's be honest here, right? The Japanese legacy begins in the Meiji Restoration. Uh, now that, that was not necessarily a revolution itself, but it was a bit of a revolutionary act taking power away from the shogunate, restoring it to the emperor, and then having the emperor reform the nation the way he did. But, but yeah, I would argue that nowhere else in the new world was there a successful revolution like this. Canada wasn't a revolution, and everywhere else revolutions were tried, they were complete disasters. Uh, what, what, would you be the, what would be the difference then? What, what separates the American Revolution from the other revolutions? Um, and you know what venerates Edmund Burke's correct wisdom there, um, and so forth. Well, at least in the New World, uh, in North America it was an Anglo-Protestant culture, and in Latin America it's a Hispano-Catholic culture. So societies where um, centralized authority is accepted uncritically is uh, are tend tend to in a revolutionary moment. See, here's the problem, right? They have institutions already in place that are the machinery of oppression, right? The very reason why there was a revolution is you have these oppressive forces on your throat. But since those institutions were not dismantled, the revolutionaries themselves just expropriate them and put a new boot on your neck. Whereas in the 13 colonies, there really was no institutional power to put on anyone's neck. It was so diffuse. Um... And I think I think that's, that's a main reason why that didn't happen. Do you think there's a case that can be made, though, that um, that it was correct to be suspicious of the American Revolution at the time? Um, that it's not purely just Tory opportunism and so forth, um, or you know that threat. Yeah, I, I could see. I mean, not only at its own time, but even today, I think there's grounds to criticize and be skeptical of the American Revolution. Um, I just feel like some arguments against it are better than others. And, and again, a, a lot of arguments against it rely on the fact that, well, it would have been, would it have been better without it? Well, we don't know. Yeah, that, um, that's the counterfactual claim that cannot be answered. No one will never know. And um, furthermore, the problem with that is it's consequentialist. I don't think the rightness or wrongness of an act is based on its consequences, because uh, consequentialism leads to all sorts of moral problems. Uh, you know, something could be right and, and lead to a quote-unquote bad outcome, like maybe you get killed. But one, one would argue that, no one would argue that, say, somebody resisting Soviet tyranny in the 1920s died for it uh, because it had a bad consequence of dying and being tortured, that that was the wrong choice to make. Well, no, it was a good choice because it was an evil tyrannical system that needed to be challenged. So the American Revolution, I think, is like all revolutions, is a mixed bag. But of all the revolutions since it, it is probably led to the best results. Um, certainly the French and Russian revolutions did not. The Latin American revolutions did not. So 
I guess it does have the honor of being the most successful and the least harmful of uh, modern revolutions. So in that way, in that way, uh, the Hoppians might have a somewhat point to be made, uh, at least in some technical sense that monarchies are superior than most republics, just certain republics are better than other republics? Well, you see, uh, the point, the, the distinction to be made here is what kind of republics, right? The sort of enlightenment republics which seek to use the power of the state to remake man in their own image, now, those are bad republics, in which case Hoppe would be right. Um, well, right, they, he'd be right in the sense that they're bad, but they're still more efficiently managed. I mean, the, the, the French Republic single-handedly held off all of the armies of Europe. I mean, that, that's extremely uh, well governed. And even before Napoleon became emperor, they had effectively uh, driven the Austrians out of Italy and the Prussians out of uh, the Rhineland. So they were tremendously successful militarily against their uh, monarchical opponents. And, and likewise, the ancient Roman Republic conquered its Hellenistic monarchical neighbors, um, and the American Republic as well. So, Oh, yeah, one side know. point. One of the reasons why I initially talked to you at all was um, I think um, uh, Oriental despots and these sort of uh, autocratic systems, secular dictatorships, to me, are very effective at military conquest. Would you agree? I mean, I, I, at least in the short term and even in the medium and long term, I think um, they tend to be at least they could tend to hold their own against, I mean, the Soviet Union held their own against a very much a, a more <laughs> developed society uh, throughout the Cold War. Um, uh, oh, well, yeah, what, 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 military, what Oriental despotisms are good at doing, they're good at turning your entire country into a barracks. <laughs> yes, they're, they're very good at that, but most people don't want to live in a barracks. <laughs> Maybe some ideologues do, but um, some giant class struggle. But um, so, so you don't think there was any any um, of that? You don't think there was any uh, of that? Those impulses in the American Revolution is was entirely clean. If you had a pie of chief intellectual uh, contributors and supporters, do you think you think you could find find some people like that? Um, what would you say that? Some people who were like what wanted to create like, Oriental despotism, or Oriental uh, despotism, or some sort of enlightened Jacobin republic. I don't think anybody in the United States wanted to create an Oriental despotism. I think there were certain elements within the founding stock that I, I don't think anybody really wanted to have a central government that would be strong enough to dictate every aspect of our life to create a new man. Even the Federalists only wanted a central government strong enough to defend America's borders against uh, colonial threats from the British and the Spanish. They didn't want to use the power of the state to remake man in some delusional uh, academics image. Um, in, in, in that regard, I think that... Now, were there some that wanted a central government that were quasi-imperialist? Yes. I mean, I think the Federalist anti Federalist debate is a good one to highlight that divide. But the Federalists were hardly, you know, Tsarists or, or Bolsheviks. That that's that's a bit of a stretch, I think. Um, and here I'll I'll just sort of finish up here. But lastly, um, what do you think of um, Christopher Hitchens on Edmund Burke and then what do you think of Edmund Burke overall uh, here? I thought his article was excellent, actually. Um, I think that I, I like Burke overall. Um, I, I do I do sort of get rubbed the wrong way by his Tory snobbishness, as Hitchens was pointing that out. Um, the the one thing that I I I find a problem with with conservative thinkers, uh, though he's certainly no reactionary, not like Demetria was, but um, they'll, they'll they'll look at the status quo as is, and they'll tend to in their fear of rapid change, they'll, they'll end up whitewashing real uh, grievances, real serious breaches of rights and real serious breaches of justice in order to, you know, oh, well, because we're afraid of a revolution. Well, of course, by not solving those problems, you're laying the foundation for the revolution you're so afraid of happening. Uh, 
that's but uh, but generally though I, I do agree with him that you know a priori politics is false you gotta look at history to get a derivative of this and there's natural organic institutions if you don't choose like family and faith uh, and even the state that are just there and are part of the sort of fabric uh, of, of of existence and that you know working within that you can then sort of cr create you know what I think it was a Thomas Sowell that said there is no there are no utopias right you're just you're just m minimizing and maximizing uh, uh, problems right they never actually go away you're just managing them um, no I think Thomas Sowell's claim is no solutions just trade-offs um, yes that's it no solutions just trade-offs uh, uh, yeah, but um, um, of the three major documents that came out of there, we'll say the official documents, um, which do you think will have the, you know, uh, Nassim Club has this, the Lindy effect, which is you judge a book by how how long it's around, um, which do you think of the three things will have the longest run influence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, or Declaration of Independence? Just a quick side effect, the Lindy effect is basically like um, the Bible's been around for 2,000 years. It's going to be around for never 2,000 years. The Shakespeare's been around 500 years. It's going to be read for never 500 years, and so forth. Um, of those three documents, um, which do you think will be read? It's, I mean, you have to assume a lot of settlers paribus with this, but which do you think will have the longest run influence? I think that personally, to me, the Constitution, as far as overall package of how we design the government, um, is pretty uh, an effective one. Even if you're a libertarian. Um, the Declaration of Independence, as far as Declaration of Independence of the three, is probably the most Jacobin. Um, um, and then the the Bill of Rights, just the the first ten of them, um, I think. I mean, that's just a general libertarian negative treatise of what the state should not do, and I think that's a very good correct guidance. What would you say to those three? I would actually say the Declaration of Independence because I think. Because the the Constitution it's too specific, it's too specific to a certain country and a certain time and place. The Bill of Rights is an adjunct to the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence is more of a universal statement that can be applied almost anywhere. And I think because of the and also it's somewhat vague. I think due to its the fact that it's vague and the fact that it's a general universal claim rather than a specific precise claim, it has not just within the United States, but throughout the world, I think will have a longer influence. Alrighty. How long have we been going for? Yeah, so uh, it's it's been about an hour and ten minutes, so I should, we should probably wrap it up. But uh, yeah, it was a really interesting uh, chat. You had a lot of interesting materials to look at. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, for bringing this up, uh, Tim. This is uh, Todd Lewis for the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.